Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to Commonwealth Publishing and Mindy Foundation for all your support of Lean Impact and for hosting this fabulous event. I personally couldn't be more thrilled to see Lean Impact launch in Taiwan. It's the country where my father was born and where my parents first met. I'm going to take about 20 minutes to give you a brief overview of Lean Impact, which is a methodology for social innovation. I'll talk about when this approach is appropriate, share the three central principles, and give plenty of examples to illustrate what this looks like in practice. Of course, we'll leave plenty of time for your questions at the end. In this time of upheaval and disruption, I found that many nonprofits are turning to the best practices for innovation, as they were designed for just that, working under conditions of extreme uncertainty. Between the ever-growing needs and the relentless pace of change today, it's become more important to focus on building a nimble organization that can take risks, learn, and adapt, rather than to perfect any single solution. But while we need innovation, we also should be careful not to misconstrue it as just bright, shiny new ideas. We want to avoid innovation for innovation's sake, I think Edison puts this in perspective. The inspiration or the idea or invention is absolutely important, but it only gets us 1% of the way there. What I term innovation is the other 99%, or the blood, sweat, and tears involved in taking risks, testing, failing, getting up and trying over and over again in order to achieve substantial impact at scale. Now, one framework that I found helpful in thinking through where to focus innovation efforts is a concept called Engine 1 and Engine 2 that was originally coined by Bain & Company. The idea is that to maximize our overall impact, we need to balance our investments in two different types of engines. Engine 1 represents the programs and services that we know work well, are on track to massively scale, and where the focus should be on turning the crank as fast as we can while continually refining and improving. On the other hand, Engine 2 represents the problems where we recognize that our current solutions are simply insufficient. Either they're not moving the needle enough or not reaching enough of the need. That is, even if we execute flawlessly, we're still gonna fall far short of our long-term goals for change. The upshot is, the farther your current trajectory is from achieving your mission, the greater investment you might want to consider in an engine too. This distinction is important because the tools, approach, and metrics that we want to use for an engine one and the engine two are quite different. For my interviews with over 200 of the most successful mission-driven organizations, three key principles stood out. Think big, start small, and relentlessly seek impact. Now, too often I see just the opposite, that we set our ambitions too low, we start too big by investing too much in a still unproven solution, and then we let our intention wander towards things like organizational survival over impact. So let's start by talking about think big. And here we should ask ourselves the question, are we being ambitious enough to truly move the needle for the problem we aim to tackle. If we treat an as yet unproven solution like an engine one and prioritize growing our short-term delivery numbers, we might see an initial spurt of interest as funders are drawn to an exciting new idea, but find that our growth trajectory flattens out over time. This may be because our solution is not clearly better than the alternatives or that Without an engine for growth, at some point, the pool of available funding gets exhausted and we have to slow down. I've seen this happen all too often with nonprofit programs. On the other hand, if our aim is to find a potentially game-changing solution and leapfrog the st status quo, we we'll want to do the opposite. That is, test and iterate at a small scale as we search for a promising idea that shows traction. Here, the number of people reached initially is irrelevant and typically very small. 
What matters instead is the slope of the curve. In other words, is growth accelerating? While progress here might seem slow initially, once you find an effective intervention along with an engine that can fuel its growth, things will quickly speed up. Here's an example of what that might look like. Vision Spring is a social enterprise that decided to focus on a 700-year-old invention that could improve productivity and learning potential. And that's simply eyeglasses. Yet, despite an estimated two and a half billion people in need, most don't have corrective eyeglasses. Innovation doesn't always have to involve something new or sexy. Vision Spring started by selling low cost eyeglasses through a network of vision entrepreneurs. They achieved inspiring results, but quickly realized that it was too expensive and they were losing money with every pair. They were doing good deeds, but they were not moving the needle. So their first pivot was that they switched to a hub and spoke model where higher end sales in more urban areas could cross subsidize outreach to poorer, more rural areas. And with this, they were able to become sustainable financially, but they realized it would take decades to build the infrastructure to provide these kinds of services around the world. So their second pivot sought to leverage existing networks, such as a large nonprofit called BRAC in Bangladesh. By selling through BRAC's extensive network of community healthcare workers, they've been able to distribute over a million pairs of glasses and through hundreds of other partnerships around the world, a total of 7 million glass, pairs of glasses. Now, many would consider this a huge success, but still it only represents a tiny fraction of the need. Thus, in their third pivot, Vision Spring established something called the iLiance, a public-private partnership that brings together companies, nonprofits, and governments to address policy and market failures. For example, an early success has been an MOU with the government of Liberia to integrate vision screening into the public school and public health system. Now, once you've laid out your big ambition and have a potential solution in hand, it's tempting to start delivering as fast as you can. But while it may seem counterintuitive, the reality is we will make a much bigger difference if we start small. Because by starting small, we can speed up our pace of learning and thereby maximize our impact. One of the things that shocked me most when I moved from Silicon Valley into the world of social change is how much people like to plan. Does that sound at all familiar? We hold a lot of design meetings, we do research, we write proposals, and we refine those proposals. By the time an idea meets the real world, a lot of risk has built up. People don't always behave as we expect and conditions in the world can change radically. So when we place a big bet like this and we fail, we fail big. So instead, if we recognize that we don't have all the answers, then we can shift to a more iterative process for design. That is, get a solution out more quickly, see what works, and then improve. This way, when we fail, we fail small, and we're essentially learning by doing. This is what's behind the build, measure, learn feedback loop. While this might sound like a new fad, it isn't. It's based on the scientific method. That is, when we have a potential solution in mind, we form a hypothesis. Then we build an experiment to test that hypothesis, gather data to measure the result, and then based on our learning, refine our solution. Here, the most critical determinant of success is not the brilliance of your initial idea, but rather how quickly you can iterate, learn, and improve. And the goal is to be able to iterate through this cycle in a matter of days or weeks rather than months or years. So think of a lightweight experiment, which you can think of as a validation sprint, as the earliest step towards rolling out a full solution, even before running a full-scale pilot. At each step, our goal should be to spend the least amount of time and money necessary to learn more, reduce our risk, and if necessary, recognize when we're heading down the wrong path. As we eliminate the most basic risks, we can stair-step our way up to deliver something more comprehensive to more people. The goal is that if we're going to fail, we want to fail as small as possible. So we, therefore, we want to start with targeted experiments that are as cheap and quick, 
quick as possible, that are intentionally and precisely directed at learning about the things we're most worried might go wrong. So for a successful social innovation, there are three critical dimensions that we need to test, validate, and optimize. Value, growth, and impact. Many organizations and tools tend to focus on just one or two of these. But if we miss even one, we could have a great solution that reaches very few people. Or a solution that reaches a lot of people, but doesn't have much impact. So let's start with value. Because if nobody wants what we're offering, we're unlikely to get very far. It's not enough that the people you hope to serve are willing to go along. But do they demand your solution? Do they tell their friends and family? Do they come back? If you have enthusiastic support, you're far more likely to be able to make a difference. Now, a classic MVP was Tesla's launch of their Model 3 car in the United States. They started out with a mere website and description of this car with a photo and an option to make a reservation by giving a $1,000 deposit. Now, there are three things that made this a great MVP. First, it was very cheap and fast compared to actually man manufacturing cars, which took years and multiple millions of dollars. It also measured behavior. People had to go to the site and they had to put down a deposit rather than just asking people's opinion by taking a survey and seeing if you wanted this car, because you wouldn't get a very accurate read. Many people might say they were interested in the car, but not ultimately buy one. And finally, the th third factor is that they introduced friction. You had to put down a $1,000 deposit. And you can imagine the people who were willing to put down a $1,000 deposit were pretty serious and were far more likely to buy a car than the people who might just say, that car sounds like a great idea. So this approach is something we sometimes call a smoke test. And it's one way we can test our value hypothesis. A similar approach in the social sector might be to test interest in a program or training by running an experiment before investing months in developing a full curriculum. This is something a nonprofit called Year Up did for their one year intensive training program to close the opportunity gap for disadvantaged urban youth. In other cases, we might want to go further by mimicking the solution we have in mind to get a better sense of how our customers are likely to behave. Code for America decided to tackle a problem where in the state of California, a third or two million eligible people were not enrolled in the SNAP food stamp program. One barrier they found was that the online registration for food stamps required 200 questions and took 45 minutes to complete. Half the people who started this, this um, registration abandoned it. So they wanted to test their, their hypothesis that a simplified form with just 18 fields would get more people to successfully complete this and also that by manually submitting this, and what they did to test this was that they would manually transcribe these answers onto a full form, uh, official government form to see if the government would accept it. The good news is that they were able to increase the completion rate by more than 70%, proving their value hypothesis with just a simple form. In this case, they also validated that the government would accept the, just the data that was in that form and validated their impact hypothesis because it turned out the next step was a full interview. And so if not all the information was complete, it could be completed during the interview step itself. So the second pillar of social innovation is impact. Here we ask the most important question, which is, does it work? Does what we're doing make a meaningful impact and really move the needle? Of course, one of the challenges is that measuring impact can be much harder and take much longer than measuring something like e-commerce transactions. This is what makes social innovation so much harder. So it helps to break down your path to impact, something we call a theory of change. For example, if your goal is to reduce the incidence of malaria by distributing mosquito nets, it can take years to determine whether infection rates have actually gone down. But we can actually check tomorrow whether people have hung up their mosquito nets. If not, we know that right away it's not going to work and we can do something about it, such as offering trainings in the town square or even hanging up those mosquito nets for people ourselves. So what happens when we don't do this? An example is a large clinical trial for tenofovir, which is a, a vaginal gel that was intended to prevent HIV transmission. 
This resulted in a big phase three clinical trial, trial in Southern Africa that took three years, over 2,000 women and multiple millions of dollars. In the end, they found no improvement in prevention of HIV. The reason was that most women were not able to use it consistently as, we re, as it was required to be used before and every after every time they had sex. The point of lean is to validate our assumptions up front so we can fail small and maximize the chances when we go big. In this case, this gel, tenofovir, worked in the lab, but it wasn't that something practical for women and not something that they wanted to use. So one example where impact can take a long time to fully realize is education. Summit Public Schools is a nonprofit that set out with a goal that 100% of their students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds would graduate from college. But of course, it takes eight years for them to try this approach and see the results for their cohort. So rather than decide on one path up front, they focus on embedding a culture and process for constant feedback and improvement. And over 57 week-long iterations with 400 students, they varied the duration, frequency, and structure of class, balancing between a mix of lectures, personalized online content, tutoring, and group projects. Each week, they gathered learning assessments, satisfaction surveys, focus groups, and teacher feedback. All of this helped them to radically improve their approach to personalized learning that has now been adopted by hundreds of public schools. Finally, the third pillar of social innovation is growth. If people want your intervention and it has real impact, the remaining question is, how can you get this to as many people as possible who stand to benefit? The easiest path to scale is, of course, through a market-driven business model. For example, Off-Grid Electric is a social enterprise in Tanzania that aims to provide clean, affordable energy in Africa by selling home solar systems. But most of their customers are unable to afford the upfront costs as they came up with it. So they came up with this idea to collect a few dollars a week through a pay-as-you-go business model based on mobile money. Their question was, would people pay? And would they keep paying? Essentially their growth hypothesis. So they started by running a simple experiment by sending a staff person to a village to first offer the solar system and then come back once a week to collect money. The good news was people were interested. They were willing to put down a deposit up front and they continued to pay for the solar system. This gave um, Off-Grid the confidence, once they verified this business model, that they could design and manufacture a system that was automated to collect money through mobile money, which is the only way they were gonna be at a scale, but now they could do so with confidence. Another example of um, impact that can take a long time to realize is policy change. Wendy's wonderful kids set out to make unadoptable unacceptable by finding permanent families for hard to place children. Their approach is to give social workers a smaller caseload so that they can take a more hands-on child-centric approach. And with this, they've been able to improve adoption placement rates by two to three times. But of course, this model is more expensive and they knew they could only reach a small fraction of kids in need through philanthropy alone. So to test whether there was sufficient appetite by state governments to adopt this model, which involved higher upfront costs, they showed how their model would ultimately save money by reducing the need for foster care. In the case of Ohio, reducing their costs by $32 million. But they weren't satisfied just with a simple polite nod from the state governments. They added some friction by asking the states to share their own data as well as their financials for foster care and adoption so that they could build a custom model and show to them what results they could expect. And by asking them to provide this, these, this data and financials, it demonstrated a level of interest and commitment on the part of these governments because they're willing to share data, they're willing to take the time, and it made it far more likely that they would persist through the process. Now, scaling impact doesn't necessarily mean having to scale your organization. A third path for growth is replication, either through franchising or open sourcing. So if you've developed the most cost-effective intervention, but either aren't interested or able to take it beyond your community, share your approach with others so they can do so. Alcoholics Anonymous boasts over 2 million members who participate in over 100,000 groups worldwide. 
Despite this impressive scale, there's only a small central organization that handles literature and basic administration. Each AA group is independent and self-supported through donations from members. Massive impact doesn't necessarily require a massive entity or massive funding. So finally, turning to the third principle for lean impact is to relentlessly seek impact. To get from these small experiments to our big vision for success, we need to stay relentlessly focused on our pursuit of impact. This can be a difficult mindset shift for nonprofits as we're often ultimately uh, intimately identified with our solutions. But as both the problem and the constraint shift, it's important to stay rooted in the felt needs of our clients, which in some cases may involve rethinking our approach. For example, during the pandemic, many organizations asked, how can we take our current solution and bring it online? Rather than stepping back to ask, what is the best way to address the current problems that have radically changed under these new constraints that we're facing? It takes deep humility to recognize when a different approach might be needed. But if we truly care about maximizing impact, we need to hold on to our solutions lightly and look to the data to learn what's most effective. For that, we need to measure what matters. We tend to focus on absolute numbers, the number of people reached or the amount of money raised. We call these vanity metrics as they sound great, but don't tell us much about whether we really made a difference. Instead, the metrics that matter are typically unit metrics. That is, for each 100 people you reach, what was the adoption rate, the persistence rate, the success rate, and the unit costs? When we test and optimize for these unit level drivers of success across value, growth, and impact, they will pay dividends over time as we reach more and more people. As a society, we're too easily satisfied and too easily celebrate the idea of doing some good. I believe we need to raise the bar. Just like we have the structures, incentives, and culture that drive companies to maximize profits and maximize shareholder value today, mission-driven organizations shouldn't be content with just having some impact. And we should hold ourselves and each other accountable to maximizing both the depth and breadth of our impact. And to do so, I believe we need to set our sights higher, start with those small experiments, and relentlessly seek to optimize the value, growth, and impact of our solution. Thank you again for joining us today. I very much look forward to your questions.